Hello, this is a talk about current understandings of the role of the gut in autoimmune diseases. My name is Dr. Jennifer Lightdale. I am Division Chief of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition at UMass Memorial Children's Medical Center and a Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, Massachusetts. The learning objectives of this talk are to first summarize the role of gut epithelium in mediating crosstalk between the microbiome and the immune system, a topic I cover more in a different webinar if you are interested to learn more. This talk will secondly outline the current understandings of how dysbiosis, or a poor microbiome, as well as resulting modifications of the gut epithelium can lead to autoimmune disease. Finally, I will discuss current clinical recommendations to prevent and or manage autoimmune conditions by focusing on nutrition and diet. The relationship between the human immune system, the gut epithelial barrier, and the microbiome is extraordinary and complex. It is important to recognize that around 80% of the human immune system is located in the gastrointestinal tract whereas it is separated from the microbiome by epithelial cells that create the lining of the intestines. Over the last 15 to 20 years, there has been an explosion of emerging evidence of significant bi-directional interactions between the immune system and the gut microbiome. Although the basis for the relationships between the immune system, gut epithelium, and microbiome are not yet fully understood, they clearly involve interactions through and or around the gut epithelium. At this point, there has been clarification around many examples of how dysbiosis, or a poorly comprised, unhealthy microbiome, can trigger immune system dysfunction, and this can contribute to development of allergic and or autoimmune diseases. In this slide, I have a picture which we've also featured in the webinar about the microbiome and the immune system. As a brief review, it shows how the gut microbiome and the immune system are really next to each other, separated only by a single layer of intestinal epithelial cells. The microbiome lives in a mucus or mucin layer in the lumen of the intestine, and it sends signals both between and through the intestinal epithelial cells, and these signals influence the behavior of the immune system, ideally in healthy ways but sometimes in ways that make the immune system act awry. The innate and adaptive immune system is an interactive group of cells and molecules that serve to protect the body from disease. When it functions ideally, the immune system actively monitors and responds to foreign, or what we call non-self, molecules that may represent threats to our bodies, such as infectious microbes. The whole system relies on the immune system being able to differentiate threats from the many benign foreign molecules that our body also encounters, such as the proteins in foods. In terms of the intestinal epithelium itself, as we said, it is a single cell layer that is best described as semi-permeable, because while it does serve as a physical barrier between whatever is in the lumen, including the microbiome, and our cells, some antigens and some pathogens are able to get past it and into the underlying tissue and bloodstreams that feed the cells. The semi-permeability of the intestines is actually by design in that it allows the absorption of nutrients. However, it also makes the body vulnerable to both dysbiosis, which again is an unhealthy microbiome, as well as dysregulated immunity. In particular, pathogens or allergens can invade the body via intracellular or extracellular mechanisms. These bad protein invaders can be given a pass if there's inflammation because inflammation or the immune system acting badly can actually loosen the connections between the cells. A healthy intestinal epithelium is reliant on having well-functioning, what are called tight junctions between the cells so that molecules, either bad or good, cannot slip between the cells and get into the body. 
It is really the vascular supply to the gut epithelium that ensures the immune cells, which swim in the bloodstream, can actively monitor for foreign molecules that permeate the epithelial barrier. Again, any molecule the immune system encounters might be either threatening or benign, and it is the job of the immune system to differentiate and to not react strongly if molecules are benign. A healthy, what we call commensal microbiome, has evolved over millions of years to live in our guts and have anti-inflammatory effects, likely because being able to keep us from getting inflamed allows the microbiome to protect itself. Any disruption to the microbiome, known as dysbiosis, can trigger inflammatory responses, and these can loosen the tight junctions between the cells. So avoiding inflammation relies on both the microbiome and the immune system working independently and influencing each other to restore healthy function of the tight junctions. In this picture on the left, you can see how the tight junctions are functioning well so that neither food particles or bacteria can infiltrate the bloodstream by going between the cells. When there is leakage across the epithelial barrier, or what is so-called leaky gut syndrome, which is shown in the picture on the right, bad bacteria, toxins, and food proteins can get into the bloodstream and trigger inflammation. In food allergy, this leaky gut phenomena can allow food particles to get in and trigger the immune system, and in the picture on the left, you can see how food proteins crossing over the epithelial barrier can then very specifically trigger Th2 cell signaling to B cells to make IgE-specific antibodies against that very food. In contrast, autoimmune disorders, which are shown in the picture on the right, do not create IgE against the triggering agent, but they do create IgE against the self. In both conditions, food allergy and in autoimmune diseases, you have an immune system that has gone awry, and in both cases, the immune system has been triggered to do this by molecules that have been able to permeate the gut epithelial barrier. Dysbiosis and leaky gut have been hypothetically linked to multiple different autoimmune diseases including type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and thyroiditis, among other conditions, which collectively are estimated to affect about 4% of the world's population. At this time, there is evidence that intestinal permeability is increased in patients with autoimmune diseases, and there are a variety of lab tests that can be used to measure this permeability. Still, because inflammation can also loosen the tight junctions, it remains to be determined if dysbiosis and leaky gut are causes or consequences of autoimmune diseases. Current clinical recommendations to prevent and or manage autoimmune diseases reflect our growing understanding of how various factors, including environmental, genetics, and nutrition, impact relationships between the microbiome, gut epithelium, and the immune system. In specifically thinking about nutritional strategies, it is important to understand how both macro and micronutrients can be used to maintain an optimal microbiome and thereby mitigate dysbiosis. Specifically, both micro and macronutrients can affect epithelial barrier integrity, as well as what antimicrobial proteins the immune system expresses what pro- and anti-inflammatory cytokines or chemical signals it sends to itself, as well as how different immune cells function. This is why Western diets with increased caloric density from fat and carbohydrate and less fiber may promote inflammation and autoimmune diseases, while Mediterranean or DASH diets that are mostly plant-based may be protective against them. When we look specifically at vitamins as key micronutrients, evidence suggests that vitamins E, A, and D may be important antioxidants in certain diseases. Specifically, 
Vitamin E has been shown to have some impact on reducing severity of rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. The mechanism by which it does this involves counteracting oxidative stress on cellular membranes. Meanwhile, vitamins A and D may modulate differentiation of immune cells in complementary ways. Vitamin D has been shown to reduce IL-12, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine or signal that the immune system sends itself. While vitamin A may enhance function of antigen-presenting cells, which are key to the immune system, and which I discuss more in depth in the webinar on food allergy. To date, low vitamin D has been linked to increased incidence of inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, and rheumatoid arthritis, as well as increased frequency and severity of systemic lupus flares. This may explain why some of these autoimmune conditions are seen more in northern hemisphere countries, where there is less sun exposure and vitamin D levels tend to be lower. In terms of other important micronutrients with immunomodulatory effects, minerals including selenium, copper, and zinc have been shown to have antioxidant capacities, likely because they help maintain cell membrane structure integrity. Minerals are also key to enzymatic activities and facilitate cellular signaling. To date, selenium deficiency has been linked to increased incidence of celiac disease and type 1 diabetes, while high levels of selenium may be protective against systemic lupus. Meanwhile, zinc is utilized by macrophages and is essential for T-cell proliferation. Although a lot of people see zinc in the pharmacy and think that it is safe to use, it's actually important to avoid under- or overdosing zinc as it clearly has both pro- and anti-inflammatory effects, and getting its balance wrong can have deleterious effects on the body. In terms of macronutrients, I will first discuss carbohydrates and note that both digestible and non-digestible carbs are important for maintaining a healthy microbiome. Digestible directly support epithelial gut integrity while non-digestible carbohydrates act as a direct source of energy for the microbiome itself, which is critical to keeping the microbiome healthy and to having healthy immune function. Among sources of carbohydrates, it's become clear that plant polysaccharides, particularly plant-based glucose, reduces inflammation by decreasing T-cell presence. On the other hand, excessive carbohydrate intake has been shown to increase circulatory inflammatory markers such as IL-6 and C-reactive proteins, and this may explain why higher, high carbohydrate diets, particularly high fructose or processed carbohydrate diets, are linked to pro-inflammatory conditions. Meanwhile, proteins, as other important macronutrients, also both directly and indirectly modulate immune function. In particular, amino acids and peptides serve as energy sources for immune cells and are also utilized by gut microbiota, which if kept healthy can affect immune system in healthy ways. We also know that dietary exposure to proteins is important for maturation of the immune system and is integral to developing immune tolerance to foods. This is why protein malnutrition adversely affects immune system function. Protein malnutrition also affects the structure and function of the gut epithelium. In terms of fats, it turns out that these need to be in balance with proteins, as well as often in balance with carbohydrates, in order to maintain a truly healthy microbiome and immune system. In fact, both high-fat and high-protein diets can exacerbate immune dysfunction, so you do need to be careful. Alternatively, high-fat, low-carbohydrate diets, also known as ketogenic diets, may help some autoimmune patients by likely affecting the microbiome. Diseases that seem to benefit from ketogenic diets include multiple sclerosis and systemic lupus erythematosus. Type of fats may also be important when considering macronutrients and immune function. Saturated and trans fats have been shown to accelerate multiple sclerosis relapses, while unsaturated fats, for example, polyunsaturated fatty acids that are high in Mediterranean diets, 
have been shown to alleviate rheumatoid arthritis symptoms and have anti-inflammatory effects in lupus. Very clear is that plant proteins are better at decreasing inflammation, while high protein diets, particularly high animal protein diets, have been shown to increase colitis in mouse models, apparently via a pro-inflammatory response of macrophages. High animal protein diets are also associated with deterioration of renal disease. Conversely, low protein diets have been shown to help treat lupus nephritis. This is why current recommended dietary protein intake of 0.6 grams per kilo per day is recommended in this condition. I hope you've enjoyed this little taste, so to speak, of why nutrition is so key to a healthy microbiome and to mitigating various autoimmune conditions. I'll conclude with the clinical implications and key takeaways of this talk, which include the concept that the gut epithelium is a functional, semi-permeable membrane that allows absorption of critical nutrients and cross crosstalk between the microbiome and the immune system, which is all generally good for you and by design. Having said that, changes or disruptions to the microbiome, or what we call dysbiosis, or excessive activation of the immune system can adversely affect the gut epithelial barrier and allow leakage across the membrane, which can exacerbate inflammatory conditions and make the gut even leakier. Nutrition, as always, is the key. Indeed, evidence shows us that both macro and micronutrients can affect the complex interplay between the immune system, the gut epithelium, and the microbiome. While this can be a bit overwhelming to imagine, it also allows for personalized dietary recommendations for patients with various autoimmune conditions. Generally speaking, low-calorie diets that are low in saturated fats and carbohydrates protect against autoimmune conditions. We also know that plant proteins and complex carbohydrates are best suited for anti-inflammatory diets through their direct and indirect effects on the microbiome. Finally, we've known for a while that Mediterranean diets are good for health, and now it is a growing understanding of the complex interplay between the gut microbiome, the gut epithelium, and the immune system that explains why these diets which are high in fiber, complex carbohydrates, and are plant-based, are superior to Western diets for protecting and managing patients with autoimmune conditions. Thank you so much for your attention. In this final slide, I have given some useful references if you would like to know more.